Welcome to Design Talk 10. This design talk is about reverse engineering. We'll be looking closely at an existing product to investigate its makeup and construction with a mindset leading towards design and manufacturing. This design talk idea came about via a question that was posed on the industrial design subreddit where someone asked for an explanation of reverse engineering. I answered by writing that it is taking an existing product or mechanism and taking it apart to discover how it works, what it is made of, and even how it is assembled in order to understand it. Typically, this is done either to remake it anew or to find ways to make it better and reproduce it as such. That's it in a nutshell. So we're going to do just that, although we will only be reproducing as a 3D model in drawings. Keep in mind that products, no matter how old they are, may have active patents. This makes it illegal to reproduce them. This does not mean, however, that someone cannot purchase them and take them apart to see how they work. If we expand from the nutshell explanation, we'll see that reverse engineering is a very big topic in not only the industrial design arena, but also in mechanical engineering, manufacturing, and many other industries. It is my hope that by viewing this design talk in its entirety, you'll get a better picture of what that entails and see how I approach this in my product design engineering role before I retired. As I've mentioned in some of my other design talks, I did quite a bit of reverse engineering in my previous work. This was done to see what the competitors had built and then determine ways to make a better product with regards to efficiency and overall production. Having done exactly that, we then patented our new products and then produced them in our own manufacturing plant. With all that said, please keep in mind that this model and upcoming drawings are based on a real-world product produced and branded by Home Depot. It has been recreated here solely for educational purposes as part of this design talk. As this design and brand is the property of Home Depot and its affiliates, they are shown here only for illustration purposes and no copyright infringement is intended. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Before we look at the process, let me just mention that I find it very interesting to take apart products to see what has gone into the design. I often marvel at the ingenuity and always come away with a real appreciation for engineers. I should mention too that for those looking to enhance their CAD skills, taking apart something like this portable work lamp and modeling it in a CAD program is a great way to enhance those skills. As we move forward, you'll see some of the challenges that I encountered. Some of you may know that I spent my engineering work life doing so from a home office. I lived in a townhouse style condo with a single car garage, which I used as a shop when required. When it came time to reverse engineer a product, the company I worked with arranged for a system to be shipped to me. Because I worked from a home office and the plant was thousands of miles away, I always took great steps to capture my process in photos and an eventual report that I would share with the team. Those images and reports were not only handy for the design team, but they also helped when establishing the assembly process that would eventually come. I can't share any of the teardown images from that time, since it was work product, but I'll illustrate similar steps as we move forward. The teardown starts with taking photos of all the steps and anything I think will be critical during the process. Although not required for this product, I would often use labels to mark out left and right, upper and lower corners and such things. I would scrape away sealants to see what was hidden, and I'd place a ruler or tape measure to include in photos. Really, anything that would keep me from having to guess when rebuilding it all in CAD. In my work with glass doors, I cut many extrusion cross-sections so that I could scan them for use when developing new profiles. Pictured here is the pages of photos and notes I made while doing the teardown of the portable work light. We'll now go through them to see the process. So here we are in Word. This is the beginning of the report with just a single photograph showing what we're going to be looking at. Here I'm saying that two units were acquired for examination, one for teardown and one for reference as a whole. After the project was finished, I returned the second one because it was undamaged. It was just used for an overall reference. And the first one was taken apart, pieces cut up, so it was not suitable for returning. 
Sometimes you can only get a hold of one example, either because it's rare and you're found it in a dump or something, or um, they're just too expensive to buy that many of them. So in this case, being able to buy two was great. Even if you forgot to take some pictures as I went along, I could go back and recapture that what I needed. So let's just go through this a little bit at a time and we'll talk about anything of interest. So here we're just showing the different faces, so front face. One of the things I wanted to make note of here was the bulb is not installed, but it's in a package that they throw into here so that it remains safe during shipping. Just the back side. Here we're starting to see there's different labels that we'll have to take into account. Right side left side, back view, and then we start looking at some of the close-up things. So here we're seeing how this is attached. Tilt bracket up here. Scroll a little more and we come to this little knob here. So we're seeing the tilt bracket knob that loosens and tightens it so you can tilt this back and forth. Some more close-ups. Here we can see how the handle is attached. If we look into here, we can see that the glass is resting in here and it's held in place with a washer and a screw. And of course, there's one on each side. If we look here, we can see that this screw here is holding the face on. And it, once you unscrew this, the face will hinge downward so you can change the bulb. And right here, although you can't see it well, there's a little O-ring. That's just to keep you from losing this screw. Once you unscrew it, the screw can stay in here. So here's a close-up of the other side, looking at some of the things we've seen already. This screw, these screws, these ones here. Here's a close-up of the tilt bracket. There's a bit of a dimple here, so when you tilt this all the way upward, it's supposed to stop on this dimple, but it doesn't protrude very far, and it's very ineffectual on this unit. Just something to keep note of. Here the front grill and base have removed, and the light's been installed, just to get an overview of that. This is the reflector we're seeing in here. Here we're showing the bulb. The bulb is an off-the-shelf T3 halogen bulb, 78 millimeter length. So now we've removed the reflector and we're seeing what's in here. Around here there's a cushion or a gasket that the glass rests against and gives a bit of weather protection. This is the lamp holder. The lamp holder is an off-the-shelf part I've found out so that's something that'll be a standardized part that gets purchased. The wires have a s insulating sleeve on them and they're held in place just down here with these push-on retainer rings just to keep them from plopping around. And then they go through into the electrical box through a hole here. Here we're going to start looking at the electrical box. It's screwed onto the back. Here we remove the cover to see what it looks like inside. Here we can see the electrical box is screwed to the main housing here. This screw just goes through and attaches to the main unit here. This other screw, aside from a fastening the box to the main body, also is a place to ground this wire here. Here we can see connectors, a retainer, and whatnot. Here when you pull out this threaded bushing, there's another cord seal in here. So when you put it in there and you tighten this up, it forces it to squeeze outward and around the cord, again for water resistance or weather resistance. Once the ground screw is removed, you can see that there's this non-insulated conductor here, a ring terminal, and then it's held in place in here and it uses two lock washers in here to give it some depth in this area so that it holds everything tight and makes a good ground connection to the metal main body. Once you start to remove the box, there's a bit of a rubber gasket in here between here and the box. Here's some other things further removed and I'm just making a note that the black 
is on the left and white is on the right, although in this case I don't think it would really matter. Here's the lamp holder removed. We can see that it gets screwed to these bosses in here. And then we start to look at all of the parts laid out. There's some close-ups, some information. So as I take these things apart, I start to measure screws and do things like that. Here, in order to remove the handle grip, I had to slice it to take it off. Here, these are laid out beside the locations they belong, and I've just labeled them to know what they are. Some more close-ups of other parts. Some more here. Again, some more close-ups and labels. And then we're moving over onto the reflector, and electrical, tilt bracket. And just to get a better overview of what they look like. There's a cord assembly with the label. There's some base plugs. The base and its screws, nuts, bolts. And then as I pull these apart, I make a card like this with the various fasteners where they go. I measure them so that I know what, what I'm going to be needing to spec later on. Then when I'm making my drawings, I can just reference back here and see what they were. Now we start to look at each part individually. At this time, I check to see whether they can be standardized parts in the sense that this is rectangular tubing, this is round tubing, and those are definitely things you can buy that you'd have to cut, paint, punch, do whatever you need to in order to use them. Here's the end caps for the base, the round tube cap, and although I couldn't find this specific one, I did find some others that would fit the size of that tube. So whether or not these were manufactured or purchased standardized parts, I can't say for sure. But we determined that as a design team on what route we wanted to take with that if we couldn't find the exact one. Same with the end caps for the rectangular tube. Here the tilt bracket. I figured that it's 15 gauge sheet steel. Of course it's just holes. It's got a dimple in it and bent to its desired shape. Here's the main body. I'm pretty sure this is zinc die cast. This is a view from behind. This is a view from the front. Here's at the top. We can see that there's going to be a label required there. Then moving on to the handle. Again, this is a standardized tubing that needs to be formed and bent and drilled and whatnot, painted and it requires this grip of sorts. Here's the handle without the grip. We can see that it's painted underneath there. And here's the handle grip that's been removed. This is the front gasket or cushion and I think it's neoprene with a medium hardness. Of course it looks to be a gray color. And the front face also zinc die cast. Here's the back end of it. There's the hinge that we talked about before. The glass is tempered. I went and took a hammer and tried to break it, and it was pretty tough, so I'm pretty sure it's tempered safety glass. And there's the grill. Looked to me to be low carbon steel rod painted. Here's the uh, reflector, and I measured that as a 30 gauge aluminum sheet metal. And then I wrote down below here what this says. This is actually embossed lettering. The tilt bracket knob is another one of those objects that could possibly be a standardized part. And if not, it would have to be manufactured. So I did cut it apart to see if that threaded unit came all the way through. And I just determined that it's an M5 zinc plated steel hex bolt, 50 mil long, with 12 millimeters exposed over here. 
The bulb holder, as I mentioned, is a standardized part. This is some of the stuff I looked through and during my research, and I thought I'd add that picture just to show that it is indeed available. Uh, braided insulation for wires. That'd be a standardized part again. And then we move on to the electrical box. Electrical box outside at the back, and we can see another label required here. Electrical box cover inside. Electrical box cover outside. And here's another label that you would get once this unit passed uh, its UL inspection. A gasket between the box and the cover. There's that little gasket that goes between the electrical box and the main body. An electrical cord retainer. That's the bushing, the cord seal, a cord assembly. We'd buy this all as one unit, including the label from a place, perhaps Zadtronics. That's a group we used to use quite often for, for this type of thing. And then I scan the labels. I uh, had made this question, do we have it supplied already installed with the cord assembly? And I think yes would be the answer for that. And I captured that text and put it here so that anybody doing this work could just select it, copy and paste, so that eliminates some of the errors and typos. Other labels was the hot surface one. Here's the same one we looked at a little bit earlier. And again, the UL label. And I always take pictures of the packaging, whether it's coming in a shipping crate or just a shipping box. And here it's a finished product, so that I did take pictures. So front top, back side and top. This is the other side. And I started to look how it's packed. So that's just opening it, pulling out the bag, and this is what's inside remaining. Here's everything pulled out of the box except for the documents. This was the wrap, just to see what it said on there. And then, of course, the notice and the guide that were in there. So I took shots of that. This is a two-sided French-English deal. And then the guide was also English and French. So I just took those pictures. So that's what the report looks like. I'd send that along and we'd review that as we needed during the whole process of development. As is often the case, I decided that I'd be using SolidWorks for this project. It's great when modeling complex components and it allows me to run through the build process of parts during these design talks if I desire. So let's move into SolidWorks now and look at the portable work light model and drawings. So here we are in SolidWorks. First thing we're going to do is change views and we're going to do an animated explosion of this unit. So I'm going to go ahead and press the spacebar to open up this unit here and select Exploded. And then I'm going to go to Configurations here. Expand this, right mouse click over Exploded and select Animate. So it's going to move pretty fast because there's a lot of parts that have to be done in 8 seconds. just like so. We'll do that again. So we can see there's quite a few parts that have to be worked on. There's quite a few that need to be manufactured and there is quite a number that are standardized parts that can be bought off the shelf. So we'll close this down. At this time, we're going to go ahead and look at the assembly build. So I'm going to go back to the feature manager here. And I want to select everything below base and suppress it for now. Just like so. So there we started with the base. And then went on to the round tube cap and made a mirror copy of that and then mirror copied those two to the other side. 
Next we did the rectangular cap, one side, and then did a mirror copy of that one. Next is the tilt bracket, and the carriage bolts, flat washer, and a hex nut. Then I did a linear copy of that one, or a local pattern, I guess they call it down in the tree. Then the main body. Then the flat washer. That's over somewhere in here, I believe. Right there. Zinc plated screw. Another flat washer. That's on that side square nut that's here so you can see that this unit here holds that from rotating as you tighten over there another square nut on the other side and the tilt bracket knob then we did the handle I don't know why I say we because I'm the one who did this and then the front gasket right here. Then we did the four machine screws for the handle. They were all placed individually because of the angle they were all on and they couldn't really mirror copy threaded objects. And then the lamp holder, like so, wiring as well as in there. Another machine screw was here and then I believe this was another pattern yep and then the halogen bulb which doesn't really come next or actually the reflector goes in next so we'll do these next things in a little bit of a different order than I showed here so we went with the reflector and then the external tooth washer and the screw and then the bulb. Next we did the front cover. And a machine screw. That was the one up here. And the O-ring as well. That's right in there. Then I hid some of these things so that I could see in behind here while I worked. And placed the glass. And at the back, it did washers and screws. So here's a flat washer and the screw. And then I did another pattern of that to do the opposite side over there. And then the compressed grill. So I made two configurations of the grill. And I did that because one, I don't want this compressed down to be fitting into these holes in here because the one you, that isn't compressed is the one that's used in the drawing so that you can have it built to that size. But it looks silly in here if this is not compressed. These come up through here then. So just keep that in mind when you're modeling that you can often have different configurations and you have to remember which one you need in the drawing. So next I'd put this gasket in here and then the electrical box then a screw to hold that in that's this one here then I put the rubber sealing washer in here that just goes in here to help with the cord seal and then a cord restrainer so the next two screws are for the restraint And then we have our threaded bushing, which is just over here. We'll leave these off for now. And so let's go ahead and add the cord with its wiring. Then we placed some lock washers in here. You can see this has got quite a bit of depth. So they needed to fill this up. 
And then you get a connector in here as well, a ring terminal, and then a washer up here to help squish this down to the main body. And this all has to be all tight enough in here to make a really decent grounding. So I think I would design this just slightly different because I found that you really had to place additional lock washers in here even with what they had set for our numbers. Let's just put this terminal in here. So that was here and this should have come in with the cord and I guess I didn't put the proper configuration in here. There should have been an assembly that included this. So I'd change that as I moved forward, if I thought about it. So let's put these uh, lock washers in now. Like so. And then there's a flat washer over top of that, like I said. And then another machine screw, just like so. And then there's a couple of wire connectors in here. like that. Then let's go ahead and put the cover or gasket seal in. That actually tucks into the cover in a little bit of a groove in there, but I'm showing it here so we can see it clearly. And then the cover. And then the screws that hold that on. And that was another pattern. Just like so. And what you won't see next is these units here. So let's hide a couple items here. Let's hide the glass. Let's hide the reflector. So here we have two retaining rings. They go here and this is the lamp lead insulation which wraps the wires. And you can see how they've just made that travel around here down through the hole and they use these retainers just to kind of hold it in place keep it from flopping around so we'll put the hidden components back visible yeah just like so so at this point we're going to go ahead and look at the drawings we'll flip through those pretty quick but i think there's lots of interesting information in there so here we are in the drawings so I put a cover sheet on this one, just with an isometric view or a trimetric view. And I just included that note here again about this being property of the Home Depot. So I'm using size B sheets for the most part. And here we can see that we have a title block down here showing general information. Designed by, drawn by, dates what measurements this is in, and some tolerance. Just a note about copyright in this case. And then some data over here is needed. So our next sheet is assembly. So here we have a full view, an exploded view, and a bill of materials. Now I never did change the cord to use the full assembly here. So it listed the ring terminal as a separate object in here instead of it being part of the cord. So I just tacked a note down here saying that that will come with the cord. That really should have been fixed, but for this I'm not too worried. Next sheet is the layout. In the layout sheet I just put a bunch of the views and I put the envelope sizes so the viewer can get an overall idea of how big this is. Next sheet is the base. This is where we start to look at individual parts. So we'll change the title bar as needed. And a lot of these, instead of having a simple listing here for materials and finish, we'll add that all into the notes that we add here. So this is standardized tubing cut to sky size. These here are spot welding of sorts. I thought it kind of looked ugly because they kind of stand up on, out and opened. I might have put them underneath so they're not visible, but I just did what they were showing in the actual model. So clean spot welds before painting, break all sharp edges. It describes what the round tube is and it describes what the rectangular tube is. And then for finish, we're going to go with a one coat of primer 
and two coats of Exalta Orange Solid gloss paint. Next is the tilt bracket. Again, very similar views, cross sections as needed, all the various dimensions, and some notes about what that is. Next is the main body, and this was really, really complex. And at the end, I'm going to go ahead and show you the main body and the front face builds. Uh, you can just skip those if you're not interested, but I want to show you just how complex they were. And I thought leaving them till the end will give you an opportunity to just avoid them if you want. So here I've just made a note that this is really incomplete for this particular unit because it is so complex. So we'd need a lot more details, maybe more than one sheet or even a larger sheet where you could add a, a whole pile more views. So here I'm just showing a number of the views with the various dimensions, some cross sections and whatnot. Here I'm showing some other views that I would want to include, but that's not all. There'd be needing details for all of this little bits and pieces here and there. I also wanted to mention that part of the complexity of this model was so much of this had draft angle in it, so it made it a little bit more difficult to produce as a 3D model and also for dimensioning. So something like this, this particular shape, since you already have it, I imagine a person could use 3D scanning instead. I've never seen a scan that's good enough for this type of thing, but perhaps if you had the money for the best scanners possible, it could do a much better job. Another option for this might just be creating a mold from, from it and utilizing that to get what you need. Anyway, there's lots of tools available when you're doing reverse engineering. I think I mentioned earlier that this would be zinc die cast and painted, so you'd detail all of that as needed. So next is the handle here. So I've illustrated this as two components, but I want it delivered as one from whoever does the manufacture of it. So I don't know how they did this because taking off this grip was really, really difficult. It doesn't stretch at all. So maybe you can buy it in an expanded form where you heat it up and it shrinks like, sh like shrink wrap, but I don't know that that's the case. It was painted in advance before this went on, so I don't know if they put it on straight and then bent the tube and crimped the ends or how they did that. But again, we have our numerous views and dimensions and all our notes about what this tube consists of, what the foam is, and wall thicknesses and all that jazz, just to make it clear for whoever's producing this. Next is that front cushion. So this is going to be an extrusion and it's going to be neoprene closed foam. It'll be an extrusion, as I mentioned. And I think we can just get it supplied in 100 foot rolls or something like that. And it can be cut and fit in the assembly line. I did notice when I was pulling this out of the main body of the real unit, it had a teeny bit of adhesive in there just to help keep it in there. So we'd have to experiment with that to see for best application. Next is reflector. That was kind of a fun one. It was a little bit challenging to make and I used the sheet metal tools in SolidWorks. I did some folds, some bends, and then I created the flat pattern from there so we could show that as is. And I've made two sheets for this one, although it could be on one larger one. So here's just the overall flat pattern and the envelope sizes. And the notes about what it's made out of, in this case 30 gauge aluminum sheet metal. And it talks about embossed text. It's front to back for best braidability. So you don't really see the text here, but I put that on the second sheet here. So this unit is symmetrical, so I mostly did dimensions up in this corner, and you can extrapolate from that the rest of it. Here I'm showing how I want the text placed, embossed. Next is the front cover. Again, this was really challenging, and it's also zinc die cast. And as I mentioned on the main body, this one too would require a lot more views and a lot more detail. Next is the glass, pretty straightforward. Four mil clear tempered safety glass, polish all edges. 
then I moved on to the grill. So when we talked about that earlier, I talked about the compressed and the non-compressed one. Well, the one in here is the non-compressed. So how that works is that all of these points are welded except for four of them. This one here, this one here, here, and here. So that the user, when installing this, can squish these together to fit up into those four little holes that are available for it. It does leave a little bit of a gap between these units when it is compressed, but it's hardly anything to make of note. Then on to the electrical box. It's pretty complex because there's a lot of draft parts in here as well, or draft angle. So it requires a lot of detail. I think I captured most of it there, but I'd need someone else to look it over to see what I missed. I read somewhere that a good way to check your work is to try to remodel it again based on what you've listed for dimensions. I don't know if we got the time to do that kind of thing when you're in business, but it certainly makes sense. Electrical box cover, again, pretty straightforward, although it does have some draft angle as well. Electrical cord. So this would be something that I would order assembled, including the label, as I mentioned. So I've just added all that detail in here. And then we'd want a gray, glossy, waterproof label. <laughs> Here's the notes, the details about what's required. So next is the cord restraint. So in here we're going to switch down to size A sheets for all of the small parts and other standardized parts. So notes to tell what we want for material and finish. Different views, section views, whatever you need. Here's the gasket, pretty straightforward. It's a manufactured part, just like the cord restraint, so it would have to be sent out, but it's got the details needed to make that happen. And here's that gasket. It goes between the cover and the box. Wire connectors. Here's that sealed washer and the bushing. The lamp holder, as I mentioned, is a standardized part. Here we have the insulation. I've added a picture just to make it a little more clear of what we're looking for. I found it really difficult measuring this and then trying to find a size and a fabric that worked. So this is kind of up in the air a little bit, so it would need a little bit more investigation. And then the bulb. So I did 3D model that, as you can see. It was kind of fun to do. But here you can see how we want it supplied. And I believe this is how it does come, so that's not like an issue that has to be surmounted. Then the round cap. Rectangular cap. These ones I actually 3D printed just to double check some of the sizing on them. So they worked pretty good after my 3D print check. Here's that knob. Whether or not it can be found as a standardized part is yet to be seen, but if not, there's enough detail here to produce it. And then, of course, we're going to have carriage bolts and a whole pile of screws and washers and nuts. So we'll just scroll through those really, really quick. just to see that we've captured everything. Just like so. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and look at two parts. We'll look at the main body and this front face, and that'll give us an idea of the challenges that went into modeling them. It's always good to see how someone does those or approaches those. Might give you some ideas in your own modeling down the road. So let's go ahead and open up the main body. There we have it. We'll just flip it up a little bit like this. And let's go ahead and roll this all the way back up to the top here. You can see how many steps there are so far in here. So like so. So basically I just started with an extruded rectangle with draft angle. Then I changed to a different plane. And I created another extrusion here with draft angle. 
I added some fillets there, another work plane. I think we're going on to the back now. So another boss extrusion at the back here and some more fillets. Next I did a cut extrude to create that area and then I did some more filleting there and there, there and there. Where do we, oh no, that's a shell. So let's go back there. Next I did the shelling of this unit like so. And I did some more filleting. Looks like that was out here somewhere. And then I did a cut extrude or cut sweep. So I did that to make this surface flat all the way around. And then I did a sweep to add the lip. So we have this placement where we put that gasket or seal. Next I added a boss extrusion up top and a cut to add some draft there. And then I mirror copied that over to the opposite side. So next I went ahead and patterned this. Now this does stick through here and I did try to delete these faces but when I went to linear pattern them after it was removed it didn't like that and didn't work so I ended up doing these all like this and we'll remove these all later in one step. So fill it. Then next I did the delete faces so that was those in there. And then I did some more filleting all around these units. Then we needed another boss extrude. And I'm not sure where that went. That's over here. So that's this screw boss mechanism, whatever you call it. And then I did a cut extrude there. Now I needed to delete some faces so that this would go naturally into this side. So I deleted that one. Then I moved two faces inward or one full face inward. Then I deleted that face and I deleted those faces. Next was a cut extrude. Not sure where that is right at this moment. So let's have a look around. Oh, that's the hole through here. Then I changed planes and then I did another boss extrude. That looks like we're working back here now. So I did some filleting on there, another fillet. I created a new plane to work on and did a cut extrude to create that area in there. Then I mirrored that all over to the opposite side like that. And then a clearance hole. Boss extrude. Another boss extrude. Those are the ones in here. And then a tapped hole. Another tapped hole. I fill it up at the top of that unit and below. Then I did some chamfering on some holes here. And I added threads to both of these. Next was a clearance hole down here and then a mirror copy to the opposite side and then I did a bunch more filleting. So there, and there, and around there. Not sure where that went. Could be inside. I'm not sure if we're there yet. Looks like it's over there. And then some more filleting. Still more filleting. And then down here we have some issues. I'm not sure if it's on here or where you can see it just yet. Down in here, we needed to delete some faces all around there to make sure that this came all the way up. Then we did some more filleting. Still more filleting. And still more filleting. Created a new plane to work on, and then another boss extrude. 
Not sure where that is. Looks like we're working in here. So here I changed the design a little bit. In the original, it had two added pieces in here that almost looked like an afterthought added to the mold. So when I designed this or redesigned this, I made them fill this whole area because I knew I needed some thicker material here to thread into for the handle. So there's also some faces hidden in here that needed to be deleted, so I did that. So it all fit and worked as one unit. Created a new plane and then did another boss extrude. So that's on the opposite side, so I couldn't do a mere copy of this feature, so I had to do it again. Did some more face deleting in there and somewhere else. I don't know where that one was, but it's probably around here somewhere. Next, we did some more filleting inside. Again, more filleting down here, and still more filleting. Next, I did another face delete. I'm not 100% sure where that is, and it doesn't highlight them when you go here, so it's hard to find them unless you go back and look for them by right mouse clicking and editing the feature, but we won't do that. Next I added another sweep. So that's around here. So this one, I wanted this to be a little bit narrower, so I added a little bit of a profile on each side and went fully around that area. Next was a cut extrude. So that's holes for this side of the handle. Then I mirrored those over to the opposite side. And then I did four threaded holes, or four added threads, basically. Next was another boss extrude. That's here. Then filleting those, cut extrude to add some holes in there. I added another plane, and then I did a rib on one of those, filleted the rib, and then mirrored over to this side, and then mirrored both of those over to the far side, just like so, and a little bit more filleting in there. Next, I added the threads to those holes, like so, and then moving on to another boss. Where is that? So that's these protrusions down here, one there, I needed to do a little bit of face deleting around there, so I did that and filleted it. And I went ahead and created a rib on that unit, fill it. Another mirror copy over to there, and another fill it. And then I mirror copied that selection all the way to the opposite side like that. Next was a sweep. So that's starting these little decorative units here. And linear pattern. And a fillet on there. And another fillet all over those. And then I mirror copied these units all the way to the opposite side, like so. Another fillet somewhere. Looks like that's the tops of these ones and another fillet there. So these fillets probably didn't mirror copy when I went to do those before. So that's why they're added again. And lastly, I added a 3D sketch down here. And that's just going to be used to help me hinge the front face because the front face kind of bounces around in this area. It doesn't really have holes for those bosses to fit into, so it can bounce around in here easy. So this helped me to mate it nicely. So that's how complex that was. Let's go back to this drawing again. And let's go ahead and open up the front face. So we'll come here. Right mouse click and open part. Good, just like so. And we're going to do just the same here. We're going to roll this all the way up to the top. 
Good. So we started basically with a sketch that we extruded with draft angle. Then I did another boss extrusion with lots of draft angle to go from here up to here. Then I did a cut extrude to create this in here. And it looks like I put draft angle in there as well. Another cut extrude to trim this to have a flat up top here. Next was a cut extrude right through that unit. Another cut extrude to create the hinging area. Another boss extrude to create this. So this was pretty tricky. So this is the best I came up with because it has to go around here like this on both sides. It's got a taper downward and it all has to blend in together. So this is how I started it with the boss extrusion. And then I did a cut to remove some of this. And then I delete face to remove that. And then I did a cut extrude again to remove that, leaving this little bit. And I deleted those faces, just like so. So it all blends together really nice. And thank goodness for that delete face tool. For those of you familiar with TurboCAD, that's quite a bit like the facet editing tool. So then I added some fillets. There was those up there. And these were down in there. And then I added some more down here. And again, around the outside here. Then I did a shell, just like so. Added a work plane where I needed it. And then I did a cut extrude. Where did that go? Let's just go back. So it looks like that shortened this down a bit. Yep. And then a boss extrude. This is starting the hinge over here. And I needed to clean that up a little bit somewhere in there. So I did a delete face. It's It was just somewhere in here. I can't see it right now. But it, because it's tapered, you end up with these weird extruded faces here and there that you don't want. Another boss extrude on there. And then I mirror copied those over to the other side. Here I added this 3D sketch. Not sure where that is. Okay, it's there. I used that again to help facilitate hinging the front to the main body. So another new work plane in order to create this you boss up here. So what you do there is you create your plane out here and you extrude and do extrude up to a surface. And of course, this also used draft angle. Then a tap tool. And I th added threads to that. Next was another cut extrude to create these notches. So remember, this is where you can press the grill and it slides those four little extra posts into that area and holds it in. Another boss extrude. That's trying to start creating these ribs in here. And because how it was made, I ended up with some of the stuff coming out there. But that's fine, because we can do another delete face. Then I did a mirror copy. And although I selected the extrusion and the delete face, the delete face didn't participate in that operation. So I deleted it again on this side. Next, I did a boss extrusion over on the other side. Mirror copied it. And at this time, I deleted all the extraneous faces at once, just like that. Next, a boss extrude. Where is that? So I added a little bit of a raised portion here. This is going to keep the glass from going too far side to side. Mirror copy there. Did another boss extrusion on the opposite side. I guess these wouldn't mirror copy. That's why they're done separately. 
and another delete face, mirror copy. And here you can see these don't blend well, so that's why I did the delete face to make sure that they did. Another boss extrude, that's what goes in there. And then a new work plane to go and create another boss, which is over here. Like so, and then I did a face delete like that. Remember this is where the glass screws holders go in. Mirror copy to the opposite side, and again the delete face. Then I added tapped holes, and I threaded them. Next I did another cut extrude to trim these flat and a delete face somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where. Must have been having to do with this. And then fillet. More filleting. And then lastly a boss extrude right there to create the HDX logo. Just like so. So I won't illustrate any more parts. Some were a little bit challenging, some were really straightforward. Some like the fasteners, I just downloaded them from McMaster Car and utilized the 3D models that they supply, made new drawings, and it went pretty quick in those instances. I just wanted to mention at this time that I really didn't make any changes to this design. I mean, you saw me do a little bit in the main body, but as I looked at this unit, and worked with it. I thought it's pretty good overall. My initial thoughts when I bought it was I didn't like how bulky this front was and I didn't think it matched the body very well. So I had contemplated making it more rectangular. Since this design talk went so long and it took quite a long time to model it all, I didn't go ahead and make any changes like that to illustrate. But you could certainly think about changes that you would have liked to have seen, and maybe you can go ahead and model this all on your own at some point. After all, you can just pop by the Home Depot and pick one up. So that's the process in a nutshell, and the thoughts and the motivations behind it. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation, and it'll give you some things to think about while you're designing your own products. If you'd like to see some TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD tips page. And if you're interested in delving deeper into TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my Textual Creations shopping page. See you next time.